Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. The Conservatives demanding answers on the Arrive Can app have formed a committee to investigate further why the app cost taxpayers close to $60 million. Political reporter Brian Lilly stops by to explain why he thinks the Prime Minister is a hypocrite. And in an effort to save more lives, the Alberta government announced millions of dollars more for medical first responders. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. The federal conservatives outlined a party motion at House Committee to study the costs involved with the Arrive Can app. The app, which was only supposed to cost around $80,000, according to the Auditor General, ended up costing taxpayers closer to $60 million. Now, the committee, which would compel representatives with the IT firm GC Strategies to answer as to why it's received nearly $258 million in federal contracts since 2015, including huge money for the RiveCan app. We have to make sure that Canadians understand what happened during the pandemic, not just with their money, but with their lives as well, with many of them being forced to quarantine for no reason. Uh, we heard today that at least 10,000 people uh, were wrongly given quarantine orders because of a glitch in the app. I mean, we're talking about 10,000 people who had to quarantine at their own expense, uh, many of whom would have missed shifts at work or missed important life events, and that's unacceptable. So the fact that these two individuals has, have already ignored previous requests is not just unfortunate, but it's, uh, it's, it's a sign of grave disrespect to Canadian taxpayers. And now it's up to the Liberals and NDP to vote with us to ensure that Canadians find the truth. You know, there's been a lot of talk over whether or not transgender women should be allowed to compete in female sports. Now, those on the LGBTQ2 plus team say, yes, absolutely. A number of transgender athletes have been dominating in various sports around the world. Now, federal conservative leader Pierre Polyev was asked if he would pass legislation, should he form government next year, of not allowing transgender women to participate in female sports. He was also asked if he supports banning transgender women from being in biological female shelters and female-only prisons. Female spaces should be exclusively for females, uh, not for biological males. Um, the, you ask if I introduce legislation on that. A lot of the spaces you described are provincially and municipally controlled. So it is unclear what federal legislation would, what would reach federal legislation would have to change them. But obviously, uh, female sports, female change rooms, female bathrooms should be for females, not for biological males. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was in Edmonton on Wednesday with a housing announcement. Ottawa will be providing over $170 million to fast-track more than 5,200 new housing units over the next few years. The PM says since the National Housing Strategy launched back in 2017, more than $2.4 billion have been invested in Alberta alone. He says that led to the creation of 100,000 new homes. Trudeau says rules have been changed to create even more affordable housing. We put $4 billion on the table, have now signed over 50 agreements specifically with cities that is changing the way zoning happens, changing the default zoning so people can build more units uh, on a single property, changing uh, the density rules so that you can create much greater density specifically around public transit so people can walk to public transit and get into work cheaper. Moving forward on uh, accelerating red tape processes for develop so developers can move forward quicker on building the homes people need. Utilization of public spaces uh, in all sorts of ways that is going to enable more housing to come. So the Housing Accelerator Agreement with the City of Edmonton is for $175 million that is going to get more homes built faster. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau also made a recent stop in Winnipeg, warning that selling anger, fear and division to Canadians will not solve any of their problems. Political reporter and Sun columnist Brian Lilly thinks it's hypocritical that those comments are coming from the Prime Minister, saying that fear and division have been his M.O. That is the bread and butter of Justin Trudeau's politics, sowing anger, fear and division. Uh, he makes the rest of the country 
fear what will happen if Alberta isn't brought to heel, whether it's on climate issues or the, more recently the gender issues. He sows fear and division on, on issues uh, surrounding Pierre Polyev, you know, claiming, well, he doesn't really support Ukraine. And in fact, he didn't condemn the death of the, the uh, Russian opposition leader strongly enough, and therefore that proves he's in Putin's pocket. Mr. Lilly will also have the latest poll numbers, which don't really paint a rosy picture for the Trudeau government. He'll have details coming up in the second half of our program. Well, it was nice to enjoy lots of sunshine again today in Lethbridge. Jeanette Rocher is now with an early peek at the forecast. Jeanette, the spring-like temperatures we've been receiving should remain with us a little while longer. Yeah, right through the weekend, it should remain lovely with pluses before heading back into the negative temperatures as we get into early next week. Uh, but even our overnight lows are remaining still relatively seasonable, not, not too bad there. And then as we get into Friday, lots of sunshine, high of 5 degrees. We're looking at a west wind at 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. And then after that, as I was saying, it's going to get lovely over the weekend before we head back into the deep freeze. And I'll be back later on the show to tell you just how great great our weekend is going to be. And all that snow behind you will be melting. Thanks so much, Jeanette. The town of Coldale is gearing up for a very special event. The Special Olympic Torch Relay will take place on Friday morning. It'll start at 11 a.m. at the Coldale Sportsplex and end at the Civic Square, where a small presentation and speeches will follow. The Torch Relay is in advance of the 2024 Special Olympics Canada Winter Games, which are taking place in Calgary, February 27th through March the 2nd. The Canadian Taxpayers Federation is calling on the Alberta government to strengthen the Taxpayer Protection Act to shield Albertans from a future provincial carbon tax. Now to talk about this in more detail is the Alberta Director of the CTF, Chris Sims, who joins us from rainy Victoria, B.C. Now Chris, you're concerned that even after federal Tory leader Pierre Polyev axes the tax should he form government in 2025, there's the potential for Alberta to bring back its own carbon tax? Yeah, because remember, the former uh, NDP government of Alberta didn't mention a carbon tax at all when they were running during the 2015 election. But nonetheless, in 2016, we got a provincial carbon tax in Alberta just the same. So we don't think Premier Daniel Smith would go there, but who knows what's going to happen in the future when it comes to provincial government. So if there is ever a time where Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's carbon tax goes bye-bye, we want to make sure it doesn't fly home to roost in Alberta. So that's why we need to strengthen the Taxpayer Protection Act to prevent a provincial carbon tax from happening here again. So let's talk about the Alberta Taxpayer Protection Act. What does it shield us from and not shield us from? It's a really big deal. So anybody who lives in Alberta or who has visited there probably notices you don't pay a PST. No provincial sales tax in Alberta. We're the only province without one. Why? Well, we have the Taxpayer Protection Act. That means that in order to have a PST in Alberta, the folks in Alberta would need to vote for one. They'd need to hold a referendum and vote in favor of a PST. It has since become really a third rail in Alberta politics. No politician wants to touch the PST. What's really great is that Premier Daniel Smith has strengthened it so that they can't increase personal income tax or business taxes. That's still protected by the Taxpayer Protection Act. So it's really strong legislation. We want them to go one step further. Put a shield against a provincial carbon tax in there. Now, your group, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, is also calling on the city of Edmonton to scrap its bag tax. Tell me more about that. This is very similar to the single-use item bylaw in Calgary, where they charge you a minimum 15 cents per paper bag and a minimum dollar per bag that is deemed reusable by the city. Now, of course, the folks in Calgary refuse to put up with that. Uh, Premier Smith even called it a mutiny on wing night because people were having to beg for napkins and, and forks on uh, wing night at pubs. And so the folks in Calgary have started the long, arduous process of getting rid of their bag fee. What we're encouraging the people of Edmonton to do is to get rid of their bag fee too. Because on Canada Day, July 1st, that fee is going up to 25 cents per bag and $2 per reusable bag. Chris Sims, Alberta Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Thanks so much for joining us today from Soggy, Victoria, BC. Alberta Premier Daniel Smith will be doing a live address to Albertans tonight. The province's website says Smith will outline her vision and plan for Alberta centered around the upcoming budget. 
The budget is set to be announced on February 29th, the second day of the spring legislature sitting. The UCP is also expected to start passing laws to follow through on its plan to dismantle Alberta Health Services. The Alberta government has declared an early start to the 2024 wildfire season, which is 10 days earlier than usual. Officials say declaring the beginning of the wildfire season will provide additional measures to Alberta wildfire, including the use of the fire ban and restriction system to help reduce human-caused wildfires. Forestry and Parks Minister Todd Lowen says there will also be more help available this fire season in battling the blazes. To help ensure we have more boots on the ground to battle wildfire this year, we have requested funding for an additional 100 wildland firefighters in budget 2024. I know Albertans are feeling uneasy about the risks posed to their homes, communities and daily lives. I understand these concerns and I share them as someone whose home is near the forest and was threatened by wildfire in 2023. So as of today, a permit is required for any burning plant in the forest protection area. This will allow Alberta's government to better manage wildfire risks and increase the level of protection in these areas, which will reduce the likelihood of new human-caused wildfires. I want to reiterate that preparations for the 2024 wildfire season have been underway for months. Alberta currently has adequate firefighters and support staff ready to respond to wildfires across our landscape and we have secured all contracts for additional personnel. Alberta's Health Minister Adriana Lagrange announced targeted funding support for medical first responders. MFRs are usually the first to arrive on scene to provide life-saving care until an ambulance arrives. Officials say through the new initiative, $3.85 million will be distributed to improve the quality of emergency care in Alberta communities. The first part of this support will be made available through the Training and Equipment Fund and building on the previous success of the Medical First Response Program. The Medical First Response Training and Equipment Fund has expanded by $1.35 million this year to now include medium and large agencies, including fire departments, remote and rural municipalities, and Indigenous communities already engaged in the Medical First Response Program. So this expansion underscores a commitment to increasing efficiency and accessibility to emergency care. A funeral was scheduled on Wednesday for the five slain family members in the town of Carmen, Manitoba. An obituary says Amanda Clearwater loved taking her children on walks. It also says six-year-old Bethany loved mermaids. Four-year-old Javen was a Spider-Man fan and two-month-old Isabella was a very special gentle princess. Clearwater's niece, Maya Lee Gratton was also killed, was looking forward to getting a tattoo on her 18th birthday. Clearwater's common law partner, Ryan Howard Manakisik, faces five counts of first degree murder. Israeli airstrikes in and around a residential building in Deir al Bala in central Gaza has killed at least 67 Palestinians. Their bodies were wrapped in blankets and were taken to Al Aqsa Martyrs Hospital. Officials say four women and four children were among those who were killed. Also on Wednesday, the aid group Doctors Without Borders said two people were killed when a shelter housing staff in the Gaza Strip was struck where Palestinians were told to seek shelter. The war between Israel and Hamas began on October the 7th after 1,200 were killed and 250 were taken hostage from southern Israel by Hamas. Of the 130 captives still being held, it's believed that around 30 have been killed by the terrorist group. Gaza's health ministry, which is run by Hamas, says more than 29,000 Palestinians have been killed since the war broke out. Relatives of hostages held by Hamas in Gaza protested outside of Israel's military headquarters in Tel Aviv. They're demanding the release of their loved ones. I expect that something will happen and I expect that my family, my father, will come back. I don't care how, but I want him at home, alive. A cutting-edge virtual camera system installed at a television station in Cyprus will enable the broadcast ministry to reach more isolated and persecuted Iranian and Afghan Christians. As we hear in this next report, it's really about helping to bring more inspirational stories to life. A frying pan. 
Christian Media Ministry Sat7 is utilizing cutting edge technology to help reach and support isolated Christians facing persecution in Iran and Afghanistan. Developed by Red Spy, it uses virtual reality to create sets that Sat7's presenters can interact with even in different places as well as between their channels. The ministry's UK director is Rachel Ladipe. For the um, Iranian and the Persian community in, in, around the world, they're, they're really spread out. They're often isolated. Um, so that enables us to really support the church in Iran, Afghanistan and Tajikistan in a completely uh, deeper way. As well as using this technology to sound with isolated Christians, Rachel says they also want to reach those who don't yet know Christ. Our hope really is that, that those people who have the questions can find the answers to them. We get a lot of contacts from people of, of all faiths who start to understand Christianity in a way they never did before through watching Sat7. Peter Wooding reporting for the Global News Alliance. So great to see. Lent is the season when Christians prepare their hearts for Easter. It's a time to remember Jesus Christ's death on the cross and to celebrate his resurrection. Pastor Rowan Crown of Amazing Grace Community Church here in Lethbridge shares why so many choose to fast this time of year. Lent can be this time where uh, we're preparing for Easter, where we set this mark and say, hey, for the next 40 days, I'm going to surrender this in order for me to spend more time with the Lord. Some people use it. I'm not going to buy Tim Horton's coffee every day for the next 40 days and give that money that I spend to a ministry that reaches uh, a city for the gospel. So I think any any time we do that, it's it's a good thing. It's it's a it's a beautiful thing. Make sure you catch the full interview with Pastor Rowan Crown and BCM producer Michael Clausen coming up later in our broadcast. Well, we enjoyed lots of sunshine again today in Lethbridge, but a little cool. Fortunately, a warming trend is on the way. Full weather details are coming up. You know, it hasn't been feeling much like winter here in southwestern Alberta lately with the mild temperatures we've been receiving. Jeanette Roche is now with all of the weather details. Jeanette, the warmer temperatures should be sticking around for the rest of this week and possibly into the weekend. Yeah, that nice spring-like feeling will remain throughout the weekend, Hal, before we get into those minuses as we get into early next week. So let's look at what's coming up for this weekend and late this week, looking at a high of 5 degrees, clear skies on Thursday, up to 6 on Friday, Saturday remaining sunny as well, high of 5, all the way up to 8 degrees on a Sunday with a clear skies as well. And then as we get into Monday, that's when we're going to see there's that dreaded S word. The snow is going to fall again on Monday. High of minus six and then minus 10 on a Tuesday here. We thought we were out of those minuses, but even though we are going back into those minuses, it still looks like we're still staying in that seasonal range. Average high for this time of year, two degrees average low, minus 10. 16 was our high temperature that happened back in 1973. And in 1957, it was a chilly minus 26. That was the record low on this day. Sun rose this morning at 7.30, sunset this evening. 6.01, so nice to see it past that six o'clock hour now as we're looking at 10 hours and 31 minutes of daylight. Okay, a fairly rainy one tomorrow on the West Coast, but looking at those double digit temperatures, high of 12 in Victoria, looking at uh, showers ending in the morning and then clearing up later on in, in the day. 10 for a high in Vancouver, looking at showers in the morning and then a chance of 40% uh, chance of showers later on in the day as well. Clear skies across Alberta tomorrow, seven in Edmonton and a lovely six degrees in Calgary, both clear skies and uh, looking at 20K winds in both of those cities as well. Also fairly sunny in Saskatoon at tomorrow, minus 12 for high, high of two in Regina, clear skies there, up to 40K winds in Regina, up to 60K winds though in Winnipeg, high of one degree and looking at partly cloudy skies. As we get into the central part of the country, Toronto looking at uh, showers in the morning, a 40% chance of showers and mix of sun and cloud later on in the day, 10 for a high there. Seven for a high in Ottawa, looking at 40% uh, chance of showers or flurries and 60% chance of showers or flurries in Montreal, looking at a high of three degrees. Even though they're seeing those flurries, they're still seeing those plus temperatures. Uh, out in uh, Atlantic Canada, Fredericton, looking at a high of two degrees, mix of sun and cloud, Halifax. Looking at some flurry activity, one for a high there. Flurries also expected tomorrow in Charlottetown, high of zero. Minus two expected in St. John's, 
Uh, St. John's is under a weather statement looking at, uh, as, as we get past the flurries tomorrow, as we get into Thursday night and into midday Friday, we're looking at freezing rain and heavy rains. Uh, freezing rain and then heavy rain, so 10 to 20 millimeters and even up to over 30 millimeters in the Avalon area. So that's what's happening. There's your weather. A new survey from Dalhousie University has found almost two-thirds of Canadians say they've switched their primary grocery store in the past year to find better prices and deals. Almost 30% of those surveyed say they exclusively choose their grocery stores based on in-store discounts and promotions. The report also found that almost 60% of Canadians consistently seek discounted food products while shopping in-store. Prices for airfares fell more than 14% in January compared to the same month in 2023. Stats Canada says plane fares also dropped nearly 24% between December and January as holiday demand gave way to last month's stay-at-home habits. The price of a ticket, however, remained 10% above 2019 levels. Analysts say it is reflecting aviation's higher costs and slightly lower capacity in a post-pandemic world. Toronto-based First Quantum Minerals has entered into an international arbitration process following the shutdown of its copper mine in Panama. It is seeking at least $20 billion. The company's CEO, Tristan Pascal, says arbitration is not the company's first choice and that it continues to hope it can reach a satisfactory solution with the Panama's government on the future of the mine. First Quantum suspended production at the end of November after Panama's Supreme Court ruled that a 20-year contract allowing for its operation in the country was simply unconstitutional. As a result, the company reported a net loss of $1.45 billion U.S. in its latest quarter. Company officials warn its ability to continue operating could be threatened within the next 12 months. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 45 points on the day to finish at 21,172. The Dow was up 48 points to 38,612. The S&P 500 was up 6 on the day to 49.81, and the Nasdaq was down 49 points to 15,580. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up 97 cents to 78.01 U.S. per barrel. Natural gas was up 20 cents to $1.78 U.S. Gold was up $1.58 on the day to $2,025.99 U.S. an ounce, and silver was down 12 cents to $2,289 U.S. an ounce. Feed wheat is at $8.11 per bushel, barley's at $6, canola's at $13.06, and corn is at $7.31 per bushel. Live cattle were down 43 cents to $1.83.98. Feeder cattle March contract was down 3 cents to $2.51.35. And Lean Hogs April contract was up 30 cents to $85.98. The Canadian dollar was up slightly over the past 24 hours to $74.06 US. Recapping one of our top stories, Alberta's Health Minister Adriana Lagrange announced targeted funding support for medical first responders. MFRs are usually the first to arrive on scene to provide life-saving care until an ambulance arrives. Officials say through this new initiative, $3.85 million will be distributed to help improve the quality of emergency care in rural Alberta communities and communities throughout the province. Well, it appears as though the Trudeau Liberals are still tanking in the polls and political reporter Brian Lilly says it may have something to do with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau creating more division here in the country. He'll have details for us momentarily. Listen, when you see news happening in your community, be sure to send us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. Also, be sure to visit our website, bridgecitynews.ca, and check out a number of stories and interviews we have featured there. Here's today's Bridge City News community calendar. On Saturday, February 24th, Streets Alive Mission is hosting their coldest night of the year fundraiser. Last year, the city came together and raised over $66,000 in support of the life-changing work of Streets Alive Mission. This family-friendly walk is to raise money to help those who are experiencing hurt, hunger, and homelessness. To register, donate, and to find out more information, visit cnoy.org slash Lethbridge. Discover more about the Blackfoot culture as they celebrate their annual International Peace Powwow and Festival taking place February 24th and 25th at the NMAC Centre in Lethbridge with doors opening at 10 a.m. Experience the spectacular grand entry, Indigenous music and dance, plus discover unique items at the craft fair and enjoy some fry bread at the concession. Tickets available now at the NMAC Centre. And that's today's Bridge City News Community Calendar.
When Prime Minister Justin Trudeau made a stop in Winnipeg last week, he warned that selling anger, fear and division to Canadians won't solve any of their problems. Political reporter and Senate columnist Brian Lilly joins us now from Toronto to talk more about this. Brian, isn't this kind of an odd message coming from the Prime Minister? Hasn't Trudeau used similar tactics in the past, including making Alberta, us here, appear to look like a bad guy? Uh, that is the bread and butter of Justin Trudeau's politics, sowing anger, fear and division. Uh, he makes the rest of the country fear what will happen if Alberta isn't brought to heel, whether it's on climate issues or the, more recently the gender issues. He sows fear and division on, on issues uh, surrounding Pierre Polyev, you know, claiming, well, he doesn't really support Ukraine. And in fact, he didn't condemn the death of the, the uh, Russian opposition leader strongly enough. And therefore, that proves he's in Putin's pocket. Um, you know, he, he, he's tried to claim that uh, Pierre shows he has disdain for Quebec by uh, criticizing a couple of Quebec mayors, even though he's done the same thing in every other part of the country. Uh, Trudeau plays the game of fear and division and, and, then, and anger, and then says, I'm not like those other guys, though. It, it's a very weird message, and it's, uh, it's basically all he's got left because the, the Trudeau liberals are getting pretty desperate when you look at the fact that they're out of policy, they're out of gas, and their polling numbers are, well, going down the drain. Yeah, let's talk about those polling numbers for just a moment here, Brian. The Trudeau liberals probably don't want to look at the poll numbers. It's really not painting a pretty picture for them when it comes to seat projections, does it? No, and you know, it, I always have to be a bit wary of seat projections. It's a bit of voodoo science. Um, you know, polling can be fairly accurate. Seat projections a bit tougher to do, but most of the seat projections from all kinds of uh, different polling firms, from aggregators, all say that Pierre uh, Polyev is going to win more than two hundred seats if an election were held today. You know, the latest uh, Abacus poll, it's a nineteen point lead. Um, 43% to 24% uh, for the Conservatives over the Liberals. The uh, Nanos poll, not quite as uh, big a lead, but still significant, well into the double digits. And it's been months and months and months of double digit lead for Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives. So it's kind of getting baked in and people are just saying, you know what, I'm, I'm fed up with Justin Trudeau, I'm done with him. He doesn't seem to get the message though. And despite the fact that he and his party are closer to the NDP than they are to the Conservatives, still seems confident that he can beat Pierre Polyev by using that anger, fear, and division, such as you know, claiming if you vote for Polyev, it's like putting uh, uh, Donald Trump in as prime minister. Not accurate, but if it scares people to vote for the Liberals, he'll do it. Don't Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives want Trudeau to stay at the helm of the Liberal Party heading into the October 2025 federal election? I assume they would, uh, but there's all kinds of speculation about will Trudeau stay or go. Uh, you know, my, my friend and colleague Warren Kinsella and I are forever debating this, and he's now in the camp that Trudeau's going to follow in his father's footsteps of 40 years ago. You know, February 29th, 1984, what did Pierre Trudeau do? He took a walk in the snow. And it, there actually was a snowstorm in Ottawa that day, and he went out for a walk, and he came back, and he decided, you know what, I'm going to pack it in. And guess what? This year, there's going to be a February 29th. Everyone's going to be watching that day for the weather forecast in Ottawa and to see what Justin Trudeau does. I don't think he's going anywhere. If I were the Conservatives, I'd want him to be at the top. But what's funny is there have been a couple of polls, should Trudeau stay or go? You know, there's more Canadians think he should go than stay now. And I think uh, there was one that said just 3% think he should remain as Liberal leader, uh, most thinking he should hand the reins over to somebody else. But when these polls are done and you say, OK, well, should Trudeau stay or go, um, you know, as liberal leader for the next election, conservatives are more likely to say he should go. If I was a conservative uh, strategist, voter, backer, I'd be like, no, let him stay. Keep him in power until the election. That's better. But, you know, people have their own views. Brian, following the disastrous reports on the Arrive Can app last week, including a new report that the main contractor received a quarter of a billion dollars in government deals, Tory leader Pierre Polyev wants further committee hearings on the subject? Yeah, he wants to call the main people behind GC Strategies to uh, come and uh, testify yet again. Um, you know, there could be value in this, Hal, if committees worked properly, but unfortunately, 
And we saw this with the, um, not the Auditor General's report, but the internal report on, uh, you know, the inner workings of the Canada Border Services Agency, which is one of the two departments that helped build this app. Uh, and they said, um, they, they shut it down. The Liberals and, and the NDP in the bloc joined them as well, said, oh, there's too many scary details in this report. Now that we've read it, we can't talk about it anymore. So are they just going to, are they going to try and get to the truth, get to the bottom of this, or are they going to try and play political games? And too often they're playing political games. And that's my fear with ArriveCan. We didn't get to the bottom of the We Charity scandal. We didn't get to the bottom of SNC-Lavalin. At a certain point, the opposition parties joined with the Trudeau Liberals, uh, opposition parties other than the Conservatives, joined with the Trudeau Liberals to say, okay, we've heard enough, we don't need to see any more. Canadians don't know the whole truth. You know, and you look at what happens in the United States. You know, yeah, a lot of it's political theater, but they actually do get answers and they do find out the facts and voters can make up their own minds. And we don't tend to do that here. It's kind of like police investigations where, you know, uh, in the States, you know everything that the police know within an hour or two of a major incident. And in Canada, it can be weeks or months later and they still say, oh, we can't say anything due to the investigation. That seems to be the, the take of uh, most MPs, sadly. You know, it's amazing, though, Brian, how an app that was supposed to cost $80,000 ended up close to $60 million, according to the Auditor General. That's incredible. And, and you know what, Hal? I, I, I've got the app on my phone. Um, I was just down in the States for a quick trip, and, and a friend said, you know what? It works now. You know, you don't have to do your vaccine stuff anymore. It's just an advanced customs declaration. They have that in the States. The app in the States works great. So I, I, I made sure to, to have it ready. My friend said it's faster than Nexus. So when I arrived back in Canada, I tried it it wouldn't load. I could log in. I could say that I was in Canada. It wouldn't load my customs declaration. That's what $60 million can buy you. There you go. Brian, a second group has pulled out of the public inquiry into foreign interference, citing concerns about how the inquiry is being run. Is this inquiry doomed to fail? It's going to go into that category we were just talking about a minute ago, where Canadians won't get the whole truth, because you can't handle the truth, as Jack Nicholson famously said in uh, in the movies. Uh, so Justice Hogue, who is running it, of course, she did not grant uh, full status to the Conservative Party. We've talked about that before. Uh, did grant full status to Michael Chong, who's Conservative MP, who was personally targeted by China. But she did grant status to several people who there have been concerns raised about them. Former Ontario Liberal Cabinet Minister uh, Michael Chan, now the Deputy Mayor of Markham, Ontario. There have long been claims that he is under the influence of the People's Republic of China, of folks in Beijing, that he's closely associated with them, too close for comfort, has been the claim. Chan's always denied that. There's Han Dong. He was given full status. He's the Liberal MP who was named and ended up having to leave the Liberal caucus over allegations that he was assisted in winning his nomination and his election by the People's Republic of China. And then there's uh, Senator Wu, who is, you know, is constantly parroting the line out of Beijing. And, and so these, these groups, first it was the Uyghurs, now it's a group representing people mainly who uh, came to Canada from Hong Kong, say, we do not feel comfortable being cross-examined by these these people that we say are part of the problem. And, and the, you know, Justice Hogue was warned about this. Um, and so it's shocking to me that uh, these three gentlemen were all given full standing before the uh, commission, which allows them to cross-examine witnesses to see all the evidence. And the Conservative Party of Canada was not granted that. Um, it, it, it seems to be a, a, an inquiry that's being run by people that don't want the whole truth out there. Last week, Federal Environment Minister Stephen Gabot made what appeared to be kind of an odd comment, Brian. He said that Canada does not need any more roads and that the federal government will stop funding them. But then he backpedaled it a little bit saying, no, no, I just meant the bigger road projects. Yeah, this was a disaster from beginning to end. So uh, Gabot made the comments out in public. They're recorded. They're noted by the media. And then he shows up on, I think he made them on Tuesday afternoon in Montreal. And uh, Montreal Gazette writes it up, publishes it, and everyone says, what? And, and scrambled, found the video, saw what he said. He shows up on Parliament Hill on Wednesday, and reporters say, why are you saying no more money for roads? Oh, I didn't say that. They read the quotes back to him. He said, well, what I really meant was, and, you know, he said it. 
he said the federal government won't be funding any more roads projects with their infrastructure money. Now, roads are primarily, depending on the road, a municipal or provincial uh, responsibility. But since Confederation, the federal government has used infrastructure funds to assist in projects like road building. It's been a major uh, project for them. And he says they're just going to stop. And in his speech, he did go on to say that we don't need more roads. We have a, a large enough existing roadway, uh, road network in Canada. Well, what is one of the major things we've been talking about lately, Hal? Immigration and the huge numbers. I'm almost 900,000 uh, temporary foreign students, mostly in Ontario, also in Alberta, a little bit in BC, and some in Quebec. We've taken in about half a million uh, new permanent residents each year, then the foreign workers and the asylum seekers, which is up to about 140,000 last year, I believe, was the final tally. You're adding in a million and a half to two million people, and you're going to say, we don't need any more roads? We don't need any more housing? You have to build housing for them. Guess what housing needs? You need roads. Eventually, you have enough, highway, or enough houses, you need highways. And he's saying we don't need any more of this. Now liberals are calling claims that he said all, all these things a conspiracy theory. No, it's not a conspiracy theory. We've got the tape. Don't, you know, you're, you're trying to convince me uh, that you didn't say something you did, that you didn't mean something you did. But this is the kind of uh, radical policy that drives Stephen Gabel, just like the, the electricity grid regulations, just like the cap on oil and gas production. I, uh, until this guy is forced to back down, he will take the most radical position and run with it and see how far he can get. You know, it's interesting as well when he was quoted as saying that more Canadians need to take public transit and ride their bicycles instead of, you know, using their vehicles. That doesn't work so well here in rural Alberta, though, Brian, i got to tell you. Uh, it's, it's huge <laughs> parts of the country it doesn't work in. I, it works for me in downtown Toronto to say, yeah, hop on the subway. I got the subway just right close to me. Yeah. But when I used to live in rural, rural Ottawa, that was not a good option. Neither was getting on my bike. Uh, you know, they don't seem to think about these things. He seems to believe that everyone lives like he does in downtown Montreal, which, by the way, he, he takes his car back and forth between Montreal and Ottawa all the time. He racked up huge amounts of, um, of kilometers with his car and driver. He gets a car and driver. You don't. You take the bus. Brian, former Prime Minister Stephen Harper toured Israel over the past few days, visiting the same places that you did, where the atrocities took place, where more than 1,200 Israelis were butchered at the hands of the terrorist group Hamas. But let me ask you something. Why hasn't Prime Minister Justin Trudeau been there yet? What have you heard from you, from Ottawa? Well, I don't think Justin Trudeau would be overly welcome uh, in Israel at the moment. Uh, on my trip, people are so fed up with Canada and the posturing of Trudeau and the trying to play both sides that I met with more ministers of government while I was there with my group from Post Media than the MPs who had gone about a month earlier had met with. There, were, there was a collection of liberal and conservative MPs that went over, including Michelle Rempel, Marty Morantz out of Winnipeg, um, and Anthony House, father, a liberal from Montreal, Marco Mendicino, a liberal from Toronto. They went over as a group. Uh, they all support Israel. They wanted to go see what was going on. Bipartisan group. No one would meet with them from the government because they're so annoyed. Stephen Harper went over. He met with them. Justin Trudeau can't get a phone call with Benjamin Netanyahu. He's always talking to Benny Gantz instead of uh, Bibi. Uh, the rolling of the eyes that I saw while I was there, uh, when you would mention Canada or Trudeau, was unbelievable. People are just fed up. So it's good to see Stephen Harper making strong, principled statements instead of what we saw from Trudeau last week. He, he joined with the uh, prime ministers of New Zealand and Australia and said, we, we need a ceasefire now and, 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 and go to a two-state solution. Two-state solution only works, how? If Israel has a partner for peace. And right now, the people in control of Gaza, that part's not controlled by the Israeli army, that's Hamas, the people using human shields, the people that carried out October 7th, the, the guys hiding behind women and children while they're shooting at Israel and then saying, uh, watch out for civilians. Uh, you know, you, you can't negotiate peace with uh, people whose opening and closing position is, you should all die. Well, Brian, some good news on the economic front here in our country. Inflation fell below 3% for the first time in a very long time. That seems to be kind of the sweet spot for the Bank of Canada. Now, could we potentially see any interest rate cuts anytime soon? 
I don't think just yet. Um, and I give a couple of caveats. So the uh, central inflation rate, uh, um, consumer price index dropped to 2.9%. Good news is, uh, you know, food inflation is slowing as well. But as Sylvain Charlebois, the food professor, has discussed, um, you know, are we really measuring it right? Because one of the things that you notice when you go to the grocery store is shrinkflation. You get a smaller package of something. Instead of uh, 600 grams, it's 540 grams. Instead of uh, a pound, it's uh, three quarters of a pound. But you're paying the same price. So that isn't actually picked up by Stats Canada, that you are, you know, the package is smaller, but the price is the same. Um, you know, he, he has real questions if we're measuring it properly. And food inflation is still higher than core inflation. So, you know, the Bank of Canada might think it's a good idea. You and I are still going to be feeling the pinch for the next little while. And I think they're going to want to see a few months of this, if not longer, before they even consider dropping interest rates further. Political reporter and Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Hal. Easter is approaching and many Christians around the world are taking part in Lent. Well, if you're like me, you may have asked, what is Lent and why do so many participate in this event? Well, we're going to learn a little bit more about that with today's guest, Rowan Crown, pastor of Amazing Grace Community Church here in Lethbridge. Pastor Rowan, welcome to Bridge City News. Thanks for having me on, Michael. Really appreciate uh, you inviting me and being here again. Yeah, our pleasure. So first of all, can you tell us a little bit about your church here in Lethbridge? Yeah, Amazing Grace uh, is on 13th Street North, um, and we've been in this location uh, since 2007, but we've been in existence uh, since uh, 2010. So we're going on 14 years of of beginning our ministry, and uh, we are very thankful that uh, God has uh, worked in and through us in this city, and uh, we're thankful for the people who make Amazing Grace their home and uh, the connections we've made uh, to this city and the community on the north side. Yeah, churches are a very integral part. Of, of every community. Now, to get to our topic at hand, can you give us a brief overview of what Lent is? Yeah, so Lent, as I was doing my research and making sure I knew my history, uh, they believe it came in about the uh, Middle Ages, some, some say the 10th, 10th century, um, and it was developed as a time to prepare one's heart uh, for Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday, and it was it was developed to really begin this time of forty days prior to Easter Sunday in a time of reflection, of repentance, of remembrance of Christ and how He came uh, to the cross, the death on the cross, and then how He rose again. And so, uh, what people would do is they would gather on what's called Ash Wednesday. And uh, they would uh, take ashes and put a cross on their forehead um, in, in a sign of uh, humility and repentance. And then they would uh, either fast from food or fast from something to prepare their hearts um, for that Easter Sunday. And, and the 40 days was chosen because really of, of, of Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. Um, and uh, he he spent time in the wilderness fasting and preparing his heart um, for what would what would be his earthly ministry, and therefore that was taken from that and prepare to prepare our hearts for uh, Easter Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. So, is there any significance to putting that black cross on one's forehead? Yeah, I think it's just a ritual that was designed as as a way to say, "Hey, this is who we are. Uh, we're we're part of the followers of Christ." Um, historically, they took the branches that were used on the previous um, Palm Sunday and they would burn them, and then those ashes would then be used to put uh, the cross on people's foreheads. So. It, it's a symbol of that humility, of that repentance, but also that continuation from year to year of um, spending time to seek the Lord 
and remember what he did for us in his life and uh, on the cross and how he rose again from the dead. Can you maybe give us a brief explanation of how these traditions surrounding Lent can have an impact on one's faith? Yeah, I think I think in the world we live in, some people need uh, symbolism to help them in their uh, growth uh, in the Lord. Uh, as a church, we don't practice Lent. We don't practice Ash Wednesday ourselves. Um, I know a lot of churches who do, and um, they find it helpful in preparing uh, the church's heart for uh, this Easter Easter season. A lot of people shy away from these traditions because, you know, through the years, traditions kind of lose their meaning and significance, and therefore they don't have the intended uh, in the intention that was uh, uh, normally given. But my opinion is, is if there's anything that can help us uh, seek the Lord, especially uh, during this Easter season, uh, then that's important that we that someone does that or a church community does that. I used to live in New Orleans where they celebrate Mardi Gras, and, and that's far from really uh, dedicating oneself to the Lord. It's, it's now used as uh, lots of different events to celebrate really oneself. And, and not the Lord. So it's easier to take these symbolic things and, and, and turn them away from what God, or not what God, but what is intended into, into seek the Lord. So that's why people would shy away from it. Um, but it's also something that people use to help prepare their hearts for uh, Easter Sunday. Right. Now, of course, one of the, one of the themes, or perhaps one of the the challenges that the Lord gave us was to take up our cross and follow Jesus. But another great theme uh, that's appropriate, especially for Easter, is probably dying to self. Could you talk about how that that Lent, maybe fasting on a broader scale, but Lent specifically, is more in line with dying to oneself? What's the value or the purpose in that? Yeah, it's it's interesting when in, in Matthew 16, when Jesus says, uh, if you want to be my disciple, you must take up your cross and follow me. Remember, that was said before he was actually going to the cross, right? So they would have related that those words to that incredible, incredible death and, and persecution one would have on, on the cross. And so their understanding what Jesus said at that time would be, man, we must suffer something greatly, right? And so that really links towards our understanding of what it really means to follow Christ is it is a call to suffer, right? It is a call to forsake. Um, I'm preaching through the book of Romans right now. And, and, and the message of Romans is the, this idea of surrender. Um, and sometimes in our lives, we have trouble surrendering and we fill our lives with all kinds of things. They may be good things, but we forget easily who we really ought to surrender to. So Lent can be this time where uh, we're preparing for Easter, where we set this mark and say, hey, for the next 40 days, I'm going to surrender this in order for me to spend more time with the Lord. Some people use it. I'm not going to buy Tim Horton's coffee every day for the next 40 days and give that money that I spend to a ministry that reaches uh, a city for the gospel. So I think any any time we do that, it's it's a good thing. It's it's a it's a beautiful thing. But it's also not limited to the 40 days before Easter. We can do that anytime. That's that's the beauty of being a believer in Christ. When God convicts us of something, we can actually say, hey, I want to do this because God is calling me to seek him deeper in my life. Right. Well, and the Bible talks about how the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. Uh, but just circling back to Lent, and you mentioned Tim Horton's coffee. Uh, are there, let's say, and I don't mean to be trite or trivial in any way, but um, through your years as a minister, have you kind of come across a top three or a top five of, of the usual suspects for Lent? Yeah, I think, I think food is, is one of them. Um, um, and it's important to make sure um, physically that uh, doing some sort of fast is beneficial and, and, and you're not doing it. Well, 
I'm going to do Lent because I really want to seek the Lord, but I also want to lose some weight on top of that, right? You know, uh, it, you know, it may be a byproduct of it, but really it should be for the sake that you want to seek God greater. Some people, I, I've heard since the social media fad, some people say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off social media uh, for a month and use that time that I usually flip through Instagram or Facebook or, or whatever and use that time to spend time with, uh, with the Lord. It could be um, a money thing. I'm not going to spend my money on this uh, type thing. So lots of different ways. There's, I don't think there's any rule of thumb of what you should do, but it, it really is the heart of the matter. How am I going to seek the Lord in preparing my heart uh, during this, what we call Lent season, to prepare my heart uh, for Resurrection Sunday? Right. It's really keeping that focus on the Lord and the work of salvation that Jesus accomplished through his death and resurrection. Can you talk a little bit about, maybe give us an explanation as to why Easter deserves this 40-day focus? Yeah, I think it's really important for us to remember that the life and death of Christ is the foremost and unifying thing of the Christian faith, right? Um, Really, it's at the heart of the gospel that Jesus would suffer so greatly for us, and his suffering um, replaces the suffering we deserve of eternal death so we could have salvation. And so, really, it is the event for our Christian life that we really need to focus on. And we need to remember, but we also need to really use this time as a, as a way that what we are called to, because really Easter goes from Resurrection su uh, Sunday to Ascension Sunday, where then we are called to go to, and make disciples of all nations. Uh, and, and that propelling of what the power of the resurrection means that Paul says in Philippians and also Romans 1, that power of the resurrection that is in us and also through us to see the church extended uh, throughout our lives and, and how we go about our work a family life, a, a work in the community that Jesus is exalted. And that happens because Jesus rose from the dead. And, and, and that is a beautiful thing for us to uh, remember, but also to keep at the very focus of our lives every day. Now, a big part of Christianity is repentance. I've heard one person describe it as repentance is turning away from everything that'll kill you. Uh, could you, <laughs> could you describe the relationship uh, or maybe how Lent can lead us to maybe realize areas of our lives that, that we need to do some repentance with? Yeah, I, I actually had a great conversation with a member of my uh, church uh, this past Sunday, and she was commenting how we don't lament um, as much in the church. And lament is a very important thing for us to remember, right? It, it says... Um, Jesus wept uh, when he was dying on the cross. His, his mother wept for him, right, in, in lament. And so really repentance is a time where we sit back and we lament and grieve our rebellion against God, right? And so I think in, in remembering the, the resurrection of Christ, we also have the cross of Christ, and, and what that brings, it, it, it brings about that day called Good Friday when uh, we remember Christ's sacrifice and he sacrificed for our sin, that we have to go to God and ask for his forgiveness. Now, um, the, the Bible talks about that we are saints. Yes, we are forgiven in our justification, right? You know, we are, we are connected to Christ because he died for us. On, on the cross for our sins, but also we struggle with ongoing rebellion, right? And so we need to um, center, we need to go back to the basics, we need to remember what the gospel means and how we need to live out the gospel each day of our lives. Right. Now, can you, let's, let's fast forward to the other side of Lent, and you mentioned Resurrection Sunday. There's a, a term in the gospels about uh, old things are passed away, all things have become new, and that we're a new creation. Can you 
describe that connection to resurrection of Jesus Christ and being made a new creation? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. How, how long do we have for that to <laughs> yeah. that question? Well, probably uh, a couple of minutes, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really who we are uh, in Christ, right? It talks about in Ezekiel that he will remove a heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh, uh, that we are uh, blind, but now we see, mm-hmm. right? You know, the, the resurrection of Christ and our faith in Christ uh, gives us new life, and uh, it is abundant new life. And so we, we, we rest in that, and that's who we are in Christ. That's why Paul, in his letters, saying, says to the saints of Ephesus, to the saints who are in Rome, right? Are they, are they saints because they're perfect? No, they're saints because they're being, um, they're being called to Christ, and Christ has loved them with the everlasting love, which he says in Jeremiah 31.3. And so we then live in the newness of our life. That salvation cannot be taken away from us. It, it cannot be extracted from us. So then we are called to live in the power of the resurrection of Christ that Paul says in the book of Philippians. And so this is all a reminder for us of the newness of our life. But that doesn't mean that we we don't fall or fail. All sin and fall short of the glory of God, right? And so we have to always remember to turn back to the Lord. That's what the message of God was through the prophets. Return to me, return. And Jesus comes and says, now, now you turn to me and continue to turn to me as you live out uh, your life in Christ. Yeah, amen to that. It reminds me of um, where the Lord says, even if you don't remain faithful, I will always be faithful. Yes, amen. And, you know, I just preached on Sunday, Romans 1, 16 and 17. Um, the righteous shall live by faith. Right. And uh, it's a beautiful reminder of our calling of who we are in Christ. Well, Pastor Rowan Crown, thank you very much for being our guest today and describing and helping us understand the tradition of Lent. Thank you, Michael, for having me. Really appreciate you guys and and those at uh, Bridge City News. Appreciate you guys. Our pleasure. And for those of you at home, I'm Michael Clausen. For all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks for watching.